Denver goes under a state of emergency as the mayor discourages large public gatherings, yet concert promoters plan to fill the Pepsi Center tonight for a Post Malone show. Colorado's drive through testing station had to turn people away due to the high demand. We're going to talk COVID-19 tonight with health and public safety experts joining us live on Next. You can text me your questions now and we'll get answers from the experts. The text number is 303-871-1491. It's a half hour dedicated to getting clear answers to your important questions. Next. I want to begin tonight with a very simple request. Please remember that COVID-19 will be mild for the majority of people who come in contact with it. But for older Coloradans and people with other health issues, it can be a very real risk to their lives. All of us who are healthy have a duty to do everything we can do to keep those vulnerable people safe. What we choose to do and not do really does matter. Let's get started and look at what we learned today. Colorado's first drive through testing station for COVID-19 closed today with health leaders saying safety concerns due to the crush of traffic at that site in Denver. People who, wanted, who waited for hours were turned away before they were able to be tested. There was a plan to give people in line a voucher for priority screening tomorrow, but that had to be scrapped because of the traffic safety concerns. That site in Lowry reopens tomorrow at 10. Colorado's coronavirus cases went from 33 to 49 today. That is expected as we expand testing. One of those positive tests is a CU Boulder employee. Denver Mayor Michael Hancock has declared a state of emergency. He is discouraging large public gatherings, but he is not prohibiting them. So a huge Post Malone concert at Pepsi Center tonight is still on. The Pepsi Center says it would be up to the promoter, Live Nation, to do the cancellation. Many other concerts around town have been canceled. A 26,000 visitor volleyball tournament in Denver was canceled early this morning. We know the NBA and the NHL seasons are suspended. March Madness is canceled. Colorado State Capitol still open for business. Legislators are trying to pass a bill to allow both parties to avoid having to meet in person to pick their primary candidates in the next month. This isn't like just canceling school or like canceling an event. We just have to make sure that we are making, uh, we're, we're thinking through the bills that we must pass. Bills require at least three days to go through the system, so legislators may work over the weekend. If and when the legislature suspends, they're going to have to come back at some point this year, if only to pass the state budget. President Trump canceled a Colorado fundraiser with Republican Senator Cory Gardner that was scheduled for tomorrow, and the president suggested today that he would have an event with Gardner at the White House instead, which fundraiser at the White House, obvious legal issues there. Gardner's campaign said that the event is not going to be a fundraiser. It's going to be a roundtable about land issues. Speaking of roundtables, we have put together a panel of experts to answer your questions tonight. You can text them to me now, 303-871-1491. Have a whole stack of questions you've been texting me this afternoon. Feel free to keep adding new ones. That's why I'll be looking down to grab those. Joined here by Dr. Michelle Barron. You are an infectious disease expert with UC University of Colorado Hospital. Thank you so much, UC Health. Scott Bookman, uh, who is the incident commander with Colorado's Department of Public Health and Environment, and Stan Hilke, who heads up Colorado's Department of Public Safety. Thank you all for taking the time to answer these questions. First and foremost, Scott, should Coloradans be concerned with the shutdown of that testing site this afternoon? And what happened? Was it a lack of tests and materials or traffic? So Kyle, it's obviously rapidly evolving and we're doing everything we can in the state to step up to the challenge uh, presented by this. Uh, we had a number of different things that came into play today. Uh, traffic, there was a huge demand. We had traffic backing up all the way down Alameda, which was becoming a major safety issue. Uh, and our staff has to be in personal protective equipment the entire time. Uh, and it reached a point where it was no longer safe for our staff. It was no longer safe for people to be in their vehicles. Uh, so we shut it down for safety reasons and we're coming up with a new plan for tomorrow. And Stan, you're thinking that public safety folks can help with this situation at this testing facility. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going we're gonna to come back tomorrow. We've brought in the National Guard with medics and extra nurses to help uh, get that work done. And you know, this is going to allow um, the Department of Health to test at other sites as well. Um, even, even despite the, the big challenges and the volume today, they were able to stay open an extra hour and, and test nearly 500 people. So it was a, a success in that regard, but uh, we were a little overwhelmed with the amount of people that did show up there. Sure. Dr. Barron, I hope that nobody who's been watching this show is surprised by what we're seeing, because um, 
this is how viruses work. Sure. Um, that said, it is startling to a lot of people. And we got a question via text today that said, how did we go from just wash our hands to don't touch your face to what they feel is society grinding to a halt? <laughs> how are we at this point this soon? Um, because these things can rapidly spread, I don't want to minimize the fact that that still is very important, washing your hands, not touching your face. We're not skipping that. We're, we're still not, doing we're that. We're not skipping that, so yeah. don't skip it now. I think it's, again, just trying to limit the spread of this disease. Now that we know it's here, the less people that come into contact with it, the more likely we are to get it done with and out, and that's kind of the goal of using these processes. I'll throw this next question out to anybody who wants it. We've seen our governor point to the successful model of Taiwan, appears to be successful. Looks like maybe South Korea has slowed the spread, kind of flattened the curve of COVID-19. They've done it through astonishing amounts of testing that we are not currently able to do. If we can't get to the point that we can test like that, what else can we do? Anybody? Well, I think... To start with, we're doing everything we can to ramp up that testing capacity. That being said, at some point, the testing becomes secondary. Um, we know we have transmission in our community. We can make assumptions that people are showing symptoms of it, probably have COVID-19. Uh, at that point, the social distancing becomes absolutely paramount. And then working to support our healthcare system to take care of those who need it the most. I think folks look, Stan, at what's happening in Italy, where you have an entire country on lockdown, everything closed but food stores and, and pharmacies. Do you know, even if you can't say it at this table, when Colorado would get to that point, or is it just kind of fly-by-wire? I think one of the things that we want to do is plan well for this event. And if you talk to some of the people in Italy and some of those contacts, they'll say they may have uh, waited too long to do social distancing. So we're talking about, you know, what other measures that are going to take place with that. And think if we have good plans, you know, we, we can get to a place where it's reasonable. Trying to find the balance between pulling that, you know, pulling that off too soon and, not, and then pulling it off too late is really where we spend a lot of our time. Mm -hmm. But do you have something in your mind and in the science that tells you this is when to do it? Or is it truly just by feel? Uh, I think we're going off the experience of, just like you mentioned, of other countries. And, and we're really talking about what is next in social distancing with re respects to schools, large crowds, events like you have spoken about tonight. Yeah, let's talk about those large, large, large events. Got a question via text as well. It said, how responsible is it for large venues to be moving forward with kind of a business as usual attitude? Well, I, I think that this is new to our country. We've, none of us have ever experienced anything like this before, and making these decisions are hard. Uh, and we're trying to find that right balance uh, and find where the responsibility lies. And so uh, let me ask you this. If scientists ruled the world, Dr. Barron, <laughs> <laughs> how would you handle big events today? Um, I think, er again, you have to look at the context of where is the event, what is going on, what's the situation at the time and place, and if there's risk of spread, trying to decide, what, is it really worthwhile, or are we potentially just going to make matters worse? Mm -hmm. And Stan, uh, folks are going to be told some things that they don't want to hear, from you can't go to this event, to this place is closed, to perhaps someday we ask you to stay within this area, or you can't go here. God forbid we ever get to the point where Italy is, where folks are being told that they can't get medical treatment. Is law enforcement preparing for disruptions and public safety issues? These are conversations that we've had, but I think we're also uh, very aware that if we do a lot of good planning and try to be really responsive to what people need, and we're, we're talking about a very compliant uh, Colorado right now. They, they're in this with us as well. Um, they want to do social distancing, it, it appears. If we can have good plans for that, I don't think we're going to get to a point where we get into that adversarial way. Um, but it's not something that, that is lost on us and something that we continue to talk about as well. Mm -hmm. What do we know, Scott, about the duration of this event? Uh, it, it might be counterintuitive to people that a longer duration is better because a longer duration would mean that we've, we've slowed the spread and it's easier on hospitals. Do you have any idea how long we could be in this? We could be in this for several months. I mean, watching what's happening in other countries, uh, despite our efforts to slow the spread, it's here. Uh, and I think by doing good social distancing, we will kind of flatten that curve that we talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, but that may extend the period of time that we're in this. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll try again one last question here. You can still text us your questions, 303-871-1491. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back with more. Uh, Dr. Barron, there's a lot of great advice out there from the CDC and others for at-risk individuals, folks who are 60-plus, pre-existing health conditions, so on and so forth. I get a ton of questions from people who are directly adjacent 
to at-risk individuals, mm -hmm. people who are not in the at-risk category but are around those people every day? What do you recommend they do? I would consider, again, assessing that individual's health, assessing your own. Certainly, if you're sick, do not visit them. If you have any symptoms that suggest that you're developing a cold symptom, it's probably not the best time to see them in person. I think we have lots of technology now that allows you to have those relationships and communications. and sort of think of the plans too, that if you did get sick and you live with one of these individuals, what are your plans for to make sure that they stay safe as well? Preparation is key to this. It, so is it possible to safely isolate within the same home as somebody who is at risk or would you suggest that they make plans to perhaps stay elsewhere? I think those are things that you would have to consider on a case-by-case -case basis and certainly again having a plan ready so that if it wasn't deemed safe just because of the way the rooms are set up or the, the necessities of what this individual might need. Mm -hmm. um, Planning for that just in case I think is a good idea. Having somebody else stay with them or that person potentially staying in a different location. All right. Stan Hilke, thank you very much. Dr. Baron Scott Bookman, please hang with more of your questions when next returns. Back now with more of your questions for public health leaders in Colorado. Nine health expert Dr. Pyle Coley joins the round table. Uh, we have Dr. Michelle Barron from UC Health here. Your specialty is infectious diseases. And Scott Bookman, who's the incident commander for the state health department. Thanks one and all. Here's an interesting question we've been getting a lot. Um, is it possible to be infected with COVID-19 more than once? If you recover, can you become infected again? I had somebody say to me the other day that people should seek out getting this because it will give them some immunity. And I wanted to crawl through the computer <laughs> at them. What do you tell people? Um, so I don't know that we know specifically with COVID-19. I think that's something that we'll always be looking at in the future. But think about what we see every year. Every year we have cold and flu season. COVID-19 is a cold and flu season type back virus. And so that's something that I suspect that you're not going to have long term. You might have some short term immunity, but it's unlikely that you're going to have immunity to the point where you won't ever have it again. So I think it's unwise, just like with chicken pox, even though you do get immunity to chicken pox, it's probably not worth the bang for the buck just to get it to quote, get over it. Yeah. Text question just came in. Who do we contact to put more pressure on the government to expand testing? You're the government, Scott. <laughs> uh, I, I don't get the sense that Colorado needs more pressure to expand testing because you guys have been begging the feds for testing. Where is our current capacity? Where do you want it to be? Well, I think, you know, in some ways the time for testing is, is moving past us. I think we need to get a good understanding of what uh, level of transmission we have in our community. Um, but I think it's clear that it's here now. Um, we needed testing months ago. Uh, but that time has passed. And so we really need to start moving past testing and really starting to think about aggressive social distancing and then really thinking about how we help our medical system prepare for a potential surge of patients. Mm -hmm. what's, what's the good argument against mandated social distancing right now? We're seeing it in New York. We're seeing it in Washington. We've seen it overseas. Does anybody have a good argument as to why the governor, I understand he's your boss, why the governor <laughs> should not do this now? Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, Dr. Coley, yes. how do you prepare a quarantine space in your home? Quarantine, again, means you might have had contact with somebody, but you may be asymptomatic, might just have cold symptoms or whatever else. How should people prepare that space in their home if they just need to sit out for a little bit? Yes, important question, because we may actually be there in a few weeks. And so the incubation period of the virus is 2 to 14 days. So you want to be prepared for about a two-week or so quarantine where you're isolated at home. So I think of three things that you need to have on hand. The first is prescription drugs. So get a supply, and I usually say two to three months supply just to be sure. The second is household products, so things like toilet paper, which we're all stocking up on, mm -hmm. um, paper towels, um, food products, canned goods, pastas, and things like that. And the final thing is cleaning products, because it's important to still keep doing those hygiene measures at home. Yeah, I had a man who used to work in the paper industry reach out to me today and beg people not to flush paper towels down the toilet because we might create a problem that we don't already have. He said toilet paper first, other paper around your house second, then your facial tissues, then your paper towels. Let's not create a problem we don't have. We're back with more of your questions in a moment.
quick check on the forecast as we're watching our next storm system rolling in from the southwest. This brings us rain and snowfall tomorrow. Tonight, still quiet and calm, but by 8 in the morning, the cloud deck's in place. We could be looking at a few isolated flurries for that morning drive. A brief break midday, and then by the afternoon, a little rain, possibly a rain-snow mix comes in. Right now, accumulation does not look impressive here in the city, less than an inch. We do have winter storm warnings, though, going toward the San Juans, 8 to 16 inches with advisories stretched across our eastern plains through Kansas, parts of Nebraska, through North Platte and along I-83 to 6 inches by Saturday. Your seven-day forecast showing a beautiful weekend back to the 60s on Sunday. Still will be a bit unsettled next week with scattered rain showers, gusty winds on Tuesday. We'll do it again on Thursday. And we're back right after this. Back with our public health expert and your questions. Nine Health Dr. Pyle Coley, uh, viewer writes in, my mom, age 70, still wants to go to her church. How do I convince her to stay away for a couple of weeks? Yeah, I think it's really important for us to realize that it's not just our individual risk anymore, it's our community risk. Yeah. So if that's not enough, what the risk is to you, then think about what you're doing to your neighbor, your friends, your family. Something tells me the 70-year-old mom is wor it might worry about the 90-year-old woman at her church. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Because every everybody's thinking about something else. Right. A lot of questions, Dr. Barron, about how long... COVID-19 can live on surfaces, in the air. There was a study this week that got a lot of folks concerned. Some of the work was done here locally where they aerosolized the virus. They put it in the air and found that it stuck around. What should we take from that? That it was a scientific experiment. You have to look at what happens in vivo, which is real life versus the experiment type. And so still you don't be alarmed by this and remember that it can live on surfaces for 30 minutes maybe to a couple of hours but in general still your hands are how this is transmitted and mm -hmm. so touching those surfaces and making sure you're clean is important mm -hmm. scott from cdphe we were talking about if we're moving out of a testing phase how do we keep people healthy and you think telemedicine is part of the answer? Yeah, I mean, I think the more we can help people in their homes and not having them go out in public, congregating in doctor's offices. So we really want to encourage accessing telehealth, calling your doctor before you go um, so we can save the services that we need. One last question I'm going to ask of all three of you, and this speaks to something that we've heard over and over, but I am so proud that we hear it less and less every day, which is, why is this a big deal? The seasonal flu comes through every year. We've had other things come through without the panic, without the wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Why should we take this more seriously? So I've said it before, and I'll say it again. It's new. We don't have immunity. It spreads quickly. It kills a lot of people. And we've seen from other countries it can very easily overwhelm our resources. So serious business. Uh, it's something that you can prevent. We have measures that we can put into place to help keep you safe and healthy. And I think following those instructions is so important. And we need to take aggressive measures to stop the spread of this to protect the public. This is not a spectator sport. Everybody is involved in this. Everybody's actions matter, even if you are the healthiest person in the world. So that's why we just beg people to listen to the experts and to take those individual actions that you can. Thank you all. We'll be right back. More than 1,500 of you texted in questions for our public health experts. Wish we could answer each one. All of you are taking COVID-19 seriously and considering what's within your control to keep yourself and others safe. Thank you. Your questions will guide us next time.